Hey folks, it's Jeremy Kirkland. You're listening to Blamo. How are we all doing? Are we all hanging in there? Is it hot? Is it hot where you are? Good God, it's 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 too hot, and the heat's never ending. Man, the, with this global warming thing, it's it's a pretty big deal. This climate change, it's happening, and uh, it's freaking hot. I don't know. Um, but speaking of hot, we got some spicy hot content today. Um, just a heads up, we recorded this while I was in Tokyo. Surprise. And I got to set a vibe a bit here. So I was in Tokyo. Uh, this is with uh, Mr. W. David Marks. And David was like, hey, come hang out with me. And uh, I was like, yeah, let's do it. And me being the idiot that I am, I had no idea where anything is in Tokyo. Um, you know, look, the trains are amazing. Everything's incredible. But it's still, you know, a little bit difficult for just a clown like me to get around. So he was like, oh, I'm in this station over here. Um, you got, you got to take this station, this, this train to this thing. Very easy. And, um, but I still had no idea. So David is, is a gentleman that he is. He meets me at the station and PS it's raining. It's raining like pretty, pretty crazy. And I'm like, I'm one of those people that's like, I had a rain coat. I had a hat. I didn't really have an umbrella. I wasn't big on carrying umbrellas. So just kind of file that away for the back of your mind. So I'm walking around like a moron just in the rain. But I'm like, it's fun. I got a raincoat, you know. So I get to the station, get off the train. There's David standing like the Statue of Liberty right out there. And, um, you know, we go for this leisurely stroll in the rain uh, to his house. And I'm just getting soaked. And it's funny because along the way, David was like, <laughs> he's like, so are you just like one of those people that's against umbrellas? And I was like, no, I'm just an idiot. You know, whatever. Um, so we, we walked to his incredibly beautiful home and, uh, fun fact, if you Google, um, W. David Mark's house, you can, you can see the photos in his house. It's beautiful. It's just this wonderland of minimalism and character, which are two things that may often seem at odds with each other, but it's not. It was there and it was a lovely home. And I was a big old goober for not having an umbrella. Um, so, you know, like a lot of people, you have like a little entryway where you take your shoes off and all that stuff. So I remember getting in there and I take my my raincoat off and it's just like, you know, it's like taking a mug out of the dishwasher. I mean, the water just falls straight off onto his floor. And I was like, yeah, my bad. Really sorry. So I'm 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 a uh, oh for oh for two for making good first impressions there, because um, so believe it or not, I think no, this wasn't the first time I met David in person. This was like the fifth or sixth, but it felt like it because it was the first time I was at his home in Japan. So um, we sat, we jammed at his studio, <laughs> which he's got this cool studio. We were playing some Beatles stuff. And uh, I will say it kind of went off from there. We're like, hey, we got mics in our hands. Let's go. So uh, David and I, we get back into it because our first pod was about a year and a half ago. I'll put a link to it in the show notes if you want to go full. I want all the, the WDM straight into the veins. But it was there. David and I discussed his upcoming book. Indie music, craftsmanship, getting dressed, artists versus creators, Taylor Cade. The ramble begins. Here we go. Yo, we're in your house. Hello, yes. We're in, da- we're in David Mark's Welcome. compound. Um, Welcome to Tokyo. Yeah, uh, I w- made it. it th- I will say for listeners, the photos of David Mark's in his house is his actual house. It's not a soundstage <laughs> that I rent just every time I do photography. Uh, can we talk about Dune 2? What, did you like it? I, I love those movies so much. And I, and not in a way where I'm like a fanboy about them, but there's just something so creepy about that world. Like, it just so creeps me out, like that relationship between The Frank feudalism, Herbert world or whatever. Yeah, like yeah. feudalism and drugs and religion and politics. It's so adult. Have you, have you read all of the books? No, I, so I, like, as a kid... If you had asked me, had I read Frank Herbert's Dune, I would be like, absolutely. I read that book. I There's no way I read it. <laughs> like, I convinced myself I read it because I read like 30 pages of it or something. Um, and then my brother read Dune Messiah and was like, I don't like this. And so for some reason, I was just like, those aren't books that you read. And yeah. now, but I'm, I'm I'm reading Dune Messiah now. Okay. I'm enjoying it. The that Because that's book two? It's book two, yeah. Yeah. It, it goes- It's going to be a weird movie. It goes really downhill. Okay. That's, um, that's my general sense of it. And I'm no completist about it. And I'm not even- Yeah. Like, I, again, it's not like I'm super into Dune- 
or Lord of the Rings or any of these things, but just of those movies, when I saw it, I was like, this is a movie. This yeah. is great. And I, I mean, saw it on a plane, loved it. I think I've seen the first Dune a couple of times. It's the same with the social network, that film. It, if it's ever on, like the plane or TV or whatever, I'm I'm in. I'm doing it. I wait, why it. the social network? Because that's vastly different yeah, than know, Dune. But it just, there's something just about like the Fincher? world. Fincher helps. Yeah. I think Fincher's like, maybe like Frank Herbert, like the first book's good, second book's bad. Like he kind of off and on, but uh, social network just nails it. In, in the new book I'm writing, I write up like the social network to me, I think is one of the most important movies of the 21st century. But let me give you a little hint. Oh, yeah. Of why the social network is good. Because I recently watched Dumb Money. Yeah, Have you seen I just, Dumb Money? I just I watched you saw it on, it on the plane, plane over It's here. a great plane movie. Okay. Yeah, it is. But Dumb Money is literally a movie in which people look at their phones and go, oh my God. Like that's the entire movie. It's just people looking at their phones and being like, did you see the number of zeros? Yeah. Because no one sells. So like in a normal film like Blow or and these aren't normal films, in a normal people get rich movie like Wolf of Wall Street or Blow, okay. it's like we got rich through the scam. Yep. Then there's the fun and games mm-hmm. where you see them spend the money and you're like, wow, that's that's crazy. That's like, it's either aspirational or wild or whatever it is, but in dumb money, cause they don't sell. That's the whole point is yeah. they're holding is that you never see them do anything other than look at a screen and go, Oh my God, yeah. did you see the screen? Yeah. And so like, it just, it's so indicative of how boring the internet is because it's just people look at screens. Like you can't do a good story about the internet. And so the thing about the social network is it's a story about the internet but it's before the internet, right? So it's a bunch of people yeah. running around creating the internet in real life. And so it's still pretty interesting because it's like things are happening in real life. They're not just only happening inside of a computer screen, which is really boring. Did you ever watch that BBC show Sherlock with mm-hmm. Benedict Cumberbatch? Definitely. I think that was, for me, it was one of the first shows that, or first like pieces of media that has text messaging perfectly interwoven Mm -hmm. into the dialogue and how they display it and even how they display it you might see me like yeah of course like they put a little bubble on there like the um miss marvel disney plus show did a really good job with that where it's like you see you know people texting each other and it's kind of superimposed across the screen and so you see their reactions and you see what they're seeing on their phone But Sherlock, I think, was probably the first, you know, because it came out like 15 years ago. Right. People do this thing, but isn't it cooler to watch people in real life? And I mean, that's maybe the other appeal of Dune. It's like we, and Frank Herbert is a total genius for thinking of this idea, which is like, because this is in the 1960s. Uh, In the future, AI is going to become so powerful that they have to get rid of it. And they have to live in this like futuristic world without AI. Yeah. And so you don't see people looking at computers the entire movie. It's amazing. Yeah. And they don't fight with guns. They fight with like primitive Swords weapons and, and yeah, yeah, yeah. So there is, I'm definitely feeling this, I don't want to call it Luddite because I, that's what I don't like about the idea of going backwards from technology because technology has obviously some good applications, but most certainly I'm noticing that the best films are the ones in which technology doesn't play a role. And then when it's only screens, it makes a really boring TV show or movie. Uh, so maybe that's that's the appeal of Dune. <laughs> yeah. It's like a, a utopian future where they've gotten rid of AI. Yeah. Matrix was like that. Hackers was another movie like that that showed. But they when they showed like people connecting online, you know, like I'm air quoting that they uh, you would see like a piece of light beaming across a microchip, right. you know, and how they would like get into a server and stuff and the, you know, and it looked like a big arcade and video game. Yeah. It's, I think it's tough to do that stuff, but you know, you'd kind of, before we started talking a little bit more about Dune, you, you kind of spoke a tiny bit about the book. So, uh-huh. I mean, cause that got announced, it but got you're announced, still, yeah. are you done with it? You're not? Done? I am 37% done with it. So, okay. uh, I, okay. Yeah. So I'm writing a book. It's a cultural history of the 21st century, uh, which, which seems very broad and it was there this is a ridiculous thing to compare the writing process to but a long time ago when Obamacare was going to be announced there's a famous line where Nancy Pelosi said we have to pass it before we know what's in it or something like that yeah. and it's kind of like with this book too it's like I have to write it to know what I'm trying to say but I kind of figure out what I'm trying to say which is it's a cultural history of the last 25 years that looks at why 
culture did not refresh itself as much as culture used to in the 20th century. And it's about the failure of groups and entities that we would call the counterculture and how they failed to usher in uh, big aesthetic changes. And the reason for that, there's many of them, but one of them is, for example, it used to be that the world was very conservative and the way that you rebelled against that was to be very liberal and permissive. And that lent itself to a lot more cultural experimentation. And now the opposite happened. And, you know, we were just talking about this living in New York, but Vice Magazine decided the way to be edgy in like the year 2002 was to be incredibly racist. Right. Not to be like, we're super liberal, right? Because liberalism had so succeeded that the only way to be clever was to just be totally bigoted, like Gavin McGinnis. So that did not lead to some sort of cultural renaissance. No. Uh, surprise. Um, <laughs> and then things like the internet, because they could never figure out how to get the business model to work. It like started from this very utopian, techno-utopian place. There's this whole lineage that goes from Stuart Brand at the Whole Earth Catalog to The Well, Kevin Kelly at Wired, Boing Boing, like all of this like, comes boing out boing. of, yeah, oh, it comes yeah. out of the same place. And it, it does have this really optimistic sense of like technology is going to free us. And I was, you know, I was just writing about anonymous uh, and all those protests. The hackers. Yeah, Yeah. the hackers. And they're taking down Scientology. Everybody hates Scientology. And they're taking down racist uh, uh, radio DJs. And they're taking down, uh, like, they're helping the Tunisians in the Arab Spring or whatever. Like, they're all good guys. And WikiLeaks at the beginning, they were good guys. Like, everything is good. And then the internet completely just turns, uh, like, from 2010 version of the internet to 2015, like, or 2016, just completely turns so i don't know this this book is it's kind of like a hit job on the 21st century is the way to, to best explain it uh, i gotta find some sort of silver linings because every single time i introduce a character it's like they're gonna be canceled by the end of the book like spoiler alert it's like a tom clancy book where they introduce someone only to kill them off it's like that uh so it's like terry richardson canceled Kanye yeah. west canceled um very few people made it out of the 21st century alive yeah I mean, is with all this stuff that you're saying, do you think that there's any sort of safe haven or place where culture can truly flourish and be nurtured? Like, where do you, what do you think is the modern day, like where Voltaire would hang out? Like, where, where's the new Algonquin round table? <laughs> I got to say, you're kind of there in Tokyo. Like, I think about this a lot, and I worry about it, but I also think there's some hints here, which is that the reason Japan and Japanese fashion was so interesting is because it was like a Petri dish. It was separated from the rest of the world. So there's all these inputs, these cultural influences, but nothing was going out. And there weren't people coming in to go see it until, I don't know, 10 years ago or something, right? Yeah. And so... You have this situation where everybody is kind of performing for themselves in the little group, but they're not necessarily uh, getting swayed by a bunch of big money overseas. And there's not a real global exchange where oh, we've got to change undercover to make Nike happy or something, right? There's, there's not a lot of tie in with the broader business world. It was just like this small little thing that was happening. And so now Tokyo, there's still a lot of people doing crazy things. And I think... Uh, what what really helps is the artisanal mindset that people bring to their brands, which is like, I'm not going to do this for money. Like I'm doing this because it's a lifestyle and I, I, I'm i passionate about it. I want to make the best stuff. So I'm going to make the best stuff. But, uh, you know, it's still at the end of the day right now, foreign money that's keeping these brands alive. And so that's going to change the equation. But when it, when you're asking, like, I don't know, at this moment in 2024, where the closed off culture is, but I really believe that closing yourself off to the world is really important for letting new cultural ideas and innovations, um, uh, what's the right word, kind of ferment, right? I mean, culture, it's a metaphor. It's like literally yeah, yeah. like a Petri dish with some bacteria in it. And you need those bacteria to grow in a weird direction that isn't uh, too much trying to overly quickly capitalize and over quickly quickly kind of round the corners of the sharp edges that you create. I mean, the whole point was to create the sharp edges to be different. And so uh, you, there's just got to be some places where people can be a little bit, do some weirder things. Now, the problem is now that uh, this is not a diatribe against woke or something, because this often is like, if only there wasn't woke, we could be yeah, yeah, yeah. like, I don't, I think that's not what I, that's not what I mean at all. You don't have to be racist and bigoted to, to be interesting, but it's just a place where if you had a musician doing a strange thing and they get picked up, that immediately is not like, okay, now I'm going to sell my song to Burger King. Right. Which is kind of where we are now. Yeah. And I mean, and then the, the argument 
against that is like, well, they have to do it because they can't make the living. But what did people used to do? I I mean, this is what I don't understand. It's like, and this is where I do think there's been a generational shift is that all the bands I grew up on, I didn't know anything about it. But like Husker Du, when they were traveling around the country, they were not like, uh, I'm sure they were not living the best lifestyle being a punk band on SST or whatever. Well, that's a thing too where, you know, and I I, want to make sure that I'm not, I don't speak with the, 99% 99% confidence on this, but I think with the increase of like a global society and globalism in general, it if you're a band, right? Like there was almost, and you're, and you're living life on the road. Well, one, more people went to shows, more people were doing things. And the only way to do those things would be to leave their house, right? And a show was cheaper at the time. And this has nothing to do with just like an economic thing, but like the the shows were cheaper to go to. They were more often. And then also in terms of the way, like even if you were doing like the DIY indie stuff, you could do that and tour and make okay money. But now with everyone like on their phones and seeing there's this more like comparison mentality that builds up, which isn't a thing where it's like, oh, but it makes competition. No, it's like this comparison thing is like, well, I need to have this or I need to have this. And that in combination with the fact that it's like easier to see shows. Here's a good example. I'll say this. So friends of mine that work in the music industry talk about a new thing that they have to figure out called like the the drop off rate of a live show in the sense that, cool, you're going to sell tickets to a show at, I don't know, whatever club. And the day of the show, there's most cases a 30 and sometimes 40% drop off Mm. of people who bought tickets and are just like, eh, I don't know. And, and so like they just change their mind or it's, it's too much of a pain in the ass. And they get refunds. Well, it it depends on how the deal was because it used to be on who showed up, you know? And so that money just kind of like would go into the ether and you'd go to like, you know, Ticketmaster or something like that. Um, But when that happens, you're not making as much money from merch and you're not right. making as much money from sales in the bar. Which you is know. the way that they make money. Yeah. Exactly. And so with that sort of delta, you have these new issues of people just like not, you know, and you lose you lose a lot of gas. And not like literally, but just like going on stage and you're like, why is there, you know, why is this place half full? Like, you know, that we sold out the show. And so like that, this, that is totally new. And that's like a almost post-COVID thing mm-hmm. that started to happen more. And people were just music, like, yeah. yeah, and people were like, well, why the fuck would I want to go see a live show? I can just like watch Johnny's version of it on YouTube. And then, you know, but that's like very specific to music. And then there's also this thing like, oh, live music's actually terrible because you have to stand up and yeah. people and it, have rubbed their phones out and you can't see anything. Which is, there's some truth to that. Yeah. You know, like he was, I saw a video on my phone <laughs> of The Rock going to Target to sell his Papatui. <laughs> okay. His, his skincare and like soap brand. And it's crazy because you see him walking out and every single person at the Target, because he's like surprising the Target, right? And every single person just immediately gets out their phones and they're viewing The Rock through their phone. Right. And you're like, dude, but he's right there. You know, you could touch The Rock. But like, also, here's a great example. Does The Rock is one of the world's most famous people. Top 100, top 200. I'd I don't say, know. I'd say he's top 10. Top 10 most famous people. Yeah. And he's like, poor me. I got to, I need some, I need some merch. Like I need a merch line. I got to make some skincare products because I'm not making enough money to live the lifestyle I want to make by being an internationally feted movie star. Like I need more. And this, that's the, that's the thing too. So it's even if you're a mid tier doing fine artist kind of type, you look above you and you see George Clooney being like, I am not, I'm just not making enough money being George Clooney. I need a tequila company. Or whatever. Yeah, he made more money on off Casamigos yeah, than he did every, off Like else. all yeah, these yeah. guys do, right? And yeah, yeah. and it's it's fine. And like Jessica Alba, I don't think she appears in movies anymore, but she's a oh, be, massive because of entrepreneur. Honest, yeah. Um. And so, okay, great. That 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 is a thing, and that's fine. But that's new. It used to be that literally you were just a movie star, and you were a movie star, and that's fine. But I can understand also why no young person is like, my dream is just to make art. It's like, I'm going to make art and then I'm going to spin it into my own paperclip company. And then I'm going to make artisanal paperclips as a way to get into the Home Depot space 
or whatever. It's just like everyone has to sell out so completely or otherwise it's like you're nobody. And everyone's, it's like literally everyone's just dumb money. They're looking at their phones going, I need another zero here. Not to do anything with. Like, because I can do everything I need because I'm a famous movie star, but I just need that extra zero. So at the end of the day, when Forbes publishes their billionaires issue, that like, I'm on it. Because yeah. like, me not being in this issue, despite the fact that I'm the rock, is pretty embarrassing. Like, it's literally that kind of mindset. And so I think there's, a, when you start complaining about money and, and art, you just sound old or you sound like, you don't get like how expensive healthcare is or, or whatever, sure. which I get, I get that. Like, I remember, I was talking to Adrian Chen, the writer, like, why aren't kids weirder and he's like because i need health insurance i was like yeah. that makes a lot of sense like i'll buy that but i also don't see up the chain there's like some threshold where you're making enough to pay health insurance and people are still like bring on the tequila brand or whatever you know it's like i gotta make cruddy premium mediocre products in order to scale my business as a famous person instead of just like i don't know be make more art do weirder stuff yeah i i think about that a lot where it's where it's like where is there a spot to experiment you know but like i think a lot about vermeer right the artist the artist vermeer Johannes Vermeer, uh, the Dutch artist who basically kind of wasn't much of a well-known or recognized artist at his time, spent the majority of his money on his paint and was good and super talented, but like wasn't really recognized until much later, but also was was making art for art's sake. Mm Mm-hmm. Right. And, you know, it makes me wonder if there was a time machine and you could go to Vermeer and and say, hey, you're going to be a master. You're actually going to be almost the father of this like Dutch master movement. Okay. Um, Would, do you think it would change what he made and how much he made? Like in terms of the quantity of his art and what he made. And I'm like, that's a question. It's rhetorical, but I think it's a, it's an interesting like thought process to put in. If you are making what you're doing, you know, like example, okay, you're going to do this book. Are you going to think of the next book? And is it going to be to get a helicopter? I mean, not that that's like no, something I can tell you specifically for. what my dream is okay. for any of my books, which is the book would do so well that the next book can be smaller. Oh, if that makes sense. Okay, because like the thing Amatora was strange in that it was a very small book that I I was like, well, I'm going to write a small book because why would I not write a small book? You because mean small in terms of the- like the 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 scope? Yes. Okay. okay. It's like a micro history of this very specific thing, and it yeah. seemed interesting and. Loved writing it, and but it's like my whole thing is being obscure. Like that was the most sold out thing I'd done <laughs> to that point. Like everything before that's even more obscure. Yeah. And so like I'm writing for very small audiences and then it's like, okay, I'm going to write this thing. And of course it's going to be relatively obscure. Okay. And then the publisher's like, well, of course this is obscure. And you know, out of the 10 publishers we sent it to, nine of them were like, that's so cool. But obviously this isn't the book that we would publish. So one, one publisher basic was like, uh, I guess we're doing this like men's fashion lines. I guess we'll, I guess we'll do this. So, you know, he, he signs the book for one of the smallest advances that they give in the industry and then it's like see i'm i'm leaving and like goes to another publisher it's like by the end of it, it's being uh, uh edited by the intern basically you know so but the point is it comes out and it's like everyone's like wow that's a really niche book congrats and in that was a sarcastic congrats like yeah, every sure. single person <laughs> like every single person who like i grew up with and like diy cool underground cult classic kind of stuff was like, mm-hmm. why would you have wasted years of your life on this tiny little thing? I was like, I don't know. I don't know. It seemed, it's cool. And, uh, and then it sold really well. And I think it sold well because like things that are in depth and niche and take you into this world that you don't know are things that people actually want. So there's this problem where gatekeepers look at really niche things and like, well, that's too niche to do. So we're going to stop it. Uh, right. but people actually want the niche thing. Right. So then status and culture was me like having my own pendulum swing of being like, oh, niche, huh? Okay, well, I'm going to do the biggest possible book. I'm going to solve all of society. I'm going to figure out everything. I'm going to figure out how the individual connects to fashion trends, blah, blah, blah. Like, I'm going to go huge. And then people are like, well, then you went too broad. Um, Who said that? I don't know. You said people. Well, like, like, this is, that this a criticism? is all imaginary criticism in my okay. head. We're just talking. Oh. This is just my anxiety talking, basically. Okay. But, um, 
<laughs> but the uh, the main point is then for the third book, it's like I could go this direction, this direction, and I have things in my head I want to do that are more like Amatora. They're like really specific and they can go really deep into a world that I think is a fascinating world. And you learn a lot about how the world works by looking at the individuals and how they make decisions and how they relate to each other and how influence happens. And so I think that that work is really valuable. But in order to get a publisher to give you an advance, it's like, it's got to have some sort of topic that someone's like, well, I could see X number of people buying that. Mm -hmm. So if I pitch something niche again, they're going to be like, well, you already did that. Like you did the niche thing. But I was like, but that's the one that's the legendary book now, right? That's the one that like my my royalty check from the last six months was bigger than my advance eight years ago, right? Right. So it's like the long selling stuff has that kind of, I can't believe somebody made this thing quality to it, but I can't believe someone made this thing is not a way to get a book deal. Do you get like, that's the paradox. So my theory, my theory is like, could (laughs) I do a book that's so big that then it gives me a blank check to do a smaller book? I don't think, I don't know if that actually works, but that's like the fantasy in my head. So I have like two or three ideas I would love to pursue that would just be like the most in-depth, like pulling stuff no one's ever seen before out of the archives and the records. But I have to like earn a lot of credibility in the market in order to even get it past the gatekeepers. Wait, 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 wait a second. I got to get my bids in on the Bezel app, but more on that in, in a minute. I get all sorts of emails and questions from you all, which I love to read and respond. And one thing I constantly get and even read in the Blamo Slack is what watch should I buy and where should I get it? It's a wild world out there with all sorts of websites and shops, but I go to Bezel. Bezel is the trusted marketplace for buying and selling your next luxury watch with expert in-house authentication on every purchase. First off, folks, it's getbezel.com. That's getbezel.com. But I use and recommend Bezel because it's the best of both worlds. You can go to the site and browse a marketplace of luxury watches, over 16,000 of them, by the way, which is a lot. And I know that Bezel is going to authenticate your purchase. Or you can create an account and get connected with your own private client advisor called the concierge. Because look, making a watch purchase can be confusing, especially when you don't know all the reference numbers. When was this made? Did they use ceramic then? Is it a triple lop, dingle top? You know, what the heck? I don't even know. But they do at Bezel, and they're here to help. Concierge, baby. Look, if looking for your watch to mark a special occasion, or maybe you're just doing research, right? They even have their own journal where you can learn all the ins and outs about Bezel and the brands and all the stuff that's happening right now. But back to my bids. Yes, Bezel now has auctions, and not just any auctions. They got Rolex, they got Cartier, they got Audemars Piguet, all the big dogs and more. So you can discover, bid, and know the Bezel team has got your back with verified in-house authentication. So visit getbezel.com on your smartphone or computer, Bezel, the trusted marketplace for buying or selling your next luxury watch. Yeah, I mean, that's it's like you could make the same similar, uh, not argument, but but point in, in regards to a lot of like filmmakers, right? Where rarely does a filmmaker get like established on the scene because of like some crazy, you know, the opus is never the first thing, right? Like, but like the Babylon guy. So, uh, oh, uh, so Whiplash, Whiplash is a perfect, like small little Damien movie. Giselle. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Small little movie mm-hmm. that you're like, that's so charming, yeah. super cool, mm-hmm. iconic performances. And then he does La La Land. Incredible. Great film. Big, big mass hit. And then it's yeah. like, and then he does what? First Man, which is literally, I, I used to think space travel and going to the moon was cool, but then I watched that movie and learned it was really sad. Yeah. It was, yeah. It, it was like really boring and sad. And then he did Babylon. He's like cash all his chips in on this like horrible epic. Yeah, I was film. gonna say I'm I'm not a huge fan of the film. No, and, <laughs> but and now he's like got to start over. You know, he's got to go a lot smaller because he he cashed in it all on Babylon, which is not the right thing to do. And I think P.T. Anderson with um, Magnolia. I, I'm people I, people probably have different opinions about it, but like Boogie Nights was the smaller, it was big, it was a three hour film, but mm-hmm. it's like a smaller capsule of a movie about a specific scene. And then he's like, I'm gonna do the sprawling thing, Magnolia. And then he has to go and do Punch Drunk Love, which is smaller again with Adam Sandler. It's like you kind of, you pendulum swing as an artist, 
because you keep like <laughs> taking the ambition. I mean, I love that. I'm just like, I, like me and PT Anderson have the same problem, you know? No, no like, I know what you're I, saying. But yeah. it's like, you, you kind of like, the, there is this worry that if you go too big, you go bland and then it has no audience at all. Like if your audience is everyone, then your audience is no one. Okay. But then it's like, wait, let's elaborate <laughs> on that more. What does that if mean? If your audience is like, yeah, every single person who reads books is going to read my book, then probably no one will buy your book. Like it yeah. has to have some sort of thing that makes people want to buy it. Like I think books also, they're not, successful books are not just entertainment. It's like the worst form of entertainment. Why is that? I mean, I, lo I love reading, but I, I think if you just want cheap entertainment, there's a lot free and cheaper and easier and faster. And Okay. And in people with ADHD, like you can, you don't have to spend 40 hours on yeah. the same yeah. thing, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. And, uh, and so like books that do well, I think that people buy them because it says something about them to everybody. Yeah. I think, I think there's certain books that are status symbols that you want to read as a rite of passage and, you know, it, and because you think it's going to equip you, um, that, that, that would be, you know, nonfiction or not, you know? Um, and there's certain stuff where it's like, I don't know, I'm trying to think of a book that I read or that I had to read that I also wanted to display. I, okay, the Cherno books. You know, I've basically read, I think other than about the banking group, the, is it the Wahlbergs or Warburgs? Um, I've read all of his books and I like proudly have them on display. But I feel like, did I read them for the right reason? And some mm -hmm. of those things, I don't know. But that, that just becomes like a weird way to kind of like psychoanalyze myself. So Yeah, I mean, look, I think every everything we do has this component and there's certainly things that you listen listen to that you don't tell people you listen to and there's certain things that you listen to a little that you over emphasize how yeah, much like you guilty listen to pleasure them. Yeah. yeah yeah and 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 there's been this real movement in the last 20 years which i write about in the book about optimism which is like we need to get rid of this concept of guilty pleasures if you love it then you love it but there is a social component to things and so like call me maybe is a catchy song if it come if i hear it I don't mind hearing it maybe I'll sing it sometimes around the, the house the Carly Rae Jepsen song yeah. yeah 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 and but like I'm I am not call, call me maybe that is not me and it's mm -hmm. not how I want to define myself and that's okay like I think it's okay for people to make that distinction and that's what you mean by guilty pleasure is I mean I think guilty pleasures are mostly shameful pleasures which is like I don't want other people to know I like this I don't I don't feel bad about it but I think someone else may judge me that my tastes are Carly Rae Jepsen. <laughs> and so it's kind of like, are you, what, what kind of music do you listen to? Oh, I don't know. You know, like call me maybe <laughs> like, well, okay. Then, uh, then I'm, you're probably not into weird avant-garde jazz. Yeah. You know? So, so, uh, I guess the point is about all this, if you make a book that is for everybody and everyone sees the book and goes, Oh, that's a book for everybody. Then it's obviously, it has no meaning for you. As like, oh, you're the kind of person who reads this book. And right. I know that's supposed to be subconscious and you're supposed to be reading books only because they're enjoyable or in, in, informative or whatever. But it's just true. It's like if if every book is Call Me Maybe. Yeah. And the Call Me Maybe also like they didn't pitch that song. Like there's we're going to do the song. It's literally for every single person on earth. It's called Call Me Baby. Like there's 4,000 songs every day probably that get pitched. It's like this is a song for every single person on earth. Yeah. And it's just the, I mean, the story goes that Bieber and Selena Gomez were like in Canada listening to the radio. This is probably some like uh, apocryphal story that I'm going to half make up. But my understanding That's is in right. Canada that you have to play a certain amount of Canadian songs on the radio. So Carly um, Rae Jepsen is probably getting a little overplayed up in um, Stratton, Ontario, wherever he's from. And so they hear call me maybe they're like what is this song this is incredible this is so catchy and then he calls scooter braun and is like hey you we got to sign we got to sign carly ray jepson and so then they make the viral video look like a homemade lip sync dub of the song and and that's what made it go crazy viral but like bieber was behind it that's like why it went big but there's like a million songs like call me maybe that are as good as call me maybe they just didn't have that like one moment of yeah justin yeah, yeah, bieber yeah. hearing it and going that's really good but the, but you can't start by having the goal of like, I'm going to make the call me baby, call me maybe of nonfiction books or whatever. Yeah. Like, it's just not going to be a good book. It has to be for somebody. Well, I think also say what you're, yeah, the stuff you're writing about, I think has a very specific audience, right? I know that. Just don't tell my publisher. Tell my <laughs> publisher it's for everybody in the whole world. Well, no, but I think that's, I mean, you just made the argument of why you, your stuff needs to have a specific audience. Because also, I think now, and this is a bigger thing, no one can really just like have a single serving relationship with anything that they interact with, right? Mm -hmm. Now, it, you have to have a very deep 
relationship. Even for you as an author, people are like, yeah, I like, I, I'll just use this podcast for example. Oh, I heard, you know, David, uh, D- uh, W. David Marks on your, on your podcast. And he talks about A, B, C, and D. And because of that, I feel like more connected to him because we both like peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, whatever that is. And then now. Call me maybe. Yeah. Okay. And now yeah. the. You know, I thought I was the only one who liked Call Me Baby. Yeah, sure, right? And so, and now they're like, oh, we have these things in common. So therefore, I'm like removing a barrier of entry for the next like piece of art that you put forward because I'm now accepting you as like a degree closer to my life because we have it's A, B, and C in common. as they say. Yeah, that is. I mean, yeah. it, that happens with me all the time, negatively and positively, where people will write me a very, um, and this is fine. I welcome this. This is great. Cause I'm the whole point, like, like they'll write me a very sort of, um, um, intimate email or something. And I'm like, wow, you shared a lot, but it's like, Oh, you, I l- learned all these things about you. And I feel that. And so then, you know, they'll be more inclined to listen to some other person that I have on or whatever. But that, so that's going to be the same with your, with, you know, with your books, because people are like, yeah, well, David Marks talks about ABCD and E. And so him writing this thing. So there you go. There's your, you made your own. So take that publisher. I'm, I'm, I'm working <laughs> at it. Uh, by the way, this is kind of a, a left turn, but yeah, have you on the pod had yeah. a meta discussion about Derek's rise to be a media celebrity? Yes and no. I think some of that stuff. Derek guy. D- yeah. Die Derek guy. Yeah. yeah. Mr. Mr. Die Workwear. Um, a, a little bit. I think it's interesting. Derek is not a person as far as I'm concerned and that I'm aware, and I don't mind if he hears this, that is like hungry for a level of sure. fame. I th- But I think that also is the power. Yeah. this is. I guess this is the point I'm trying to make. If there's a meta point. Yeah. It's like the people who are just out there passionately doing their thing mm-hmm. th- without an idea of that I'm going to be this like mass media celebrity end up having more success being like the deep person into the thing. Yeah. I mean, I've had multiple very large publishing outlets reach out to me specifically asking me to go on the record and start talking all these things about people I have interacted with, but usually Derek pops up and I'm like, dude, he's just a guy and he's doing his thing. And it's like, why can't people just want to have a surface level interaction with someone's art? And it's like, no, I need to know more. I need yeah. to know, do you like peanut butter and jelly yeah. sandwiches? Do you like Call Me Maybe? <laughs> yeah. What's your stance on the Israel-Palestine situation? Yeah. So, right. uh, <laughs> yeah, no, I understand that. So the thing that's crazy about Derek is that every six weeks or so, and it's incredibly nice that he does this, he'll reference Amatora yeah. in his threads he'll have yeah. like some thread and like thread number se- like the tweet number seven yeah in this thread will be like and there's this book amatora about uh, american fashion japan yamamoto from kate is great whatever like it's it's just in the flow yeah and my sales will go through the roof <laughs> really stuff this like tweet seven buried down and every time i see that like the two thing two things number one it's like that guy's got some influence yeah, yeah absolutely he does. not just on like neckties and and um making fun of right-wing politicians and <laughs> then also just the fact that there's like still people out there like i think amatory in a sense is saturated its market like if you're into fashion menswear like you no. gotta know this book exists but they don't no. nobody there's still this like well and also i think you you might be overlooking the fact that there are new people entering that yes. market every day and th- this is the thing i also did didn't think about and no one thought about when they when they berated me for writing such a niche book, which is like, yes, it's niche, but it could grow. And I didn't even think about this, right? But whatever you do, I mean, it always has to be on the theory. And like, just to, to make this not about me, it's like, if I were a young artist or a young creator doing whatever, I would have faith. In some ways, you have to take a gamble that like the thing you're going to do is not going to make any sense to anyone now. But mm-hmm. it could in five years. Mm-hmm. And if you go that direction, then you're going to cash in big. Whereas if you're like, I'm going to chase the thing that's already big and then it's too late. Like I wish someone had told me that making music, which it's like, I'm going to make a bunch of music that sounds like artists who are already popular. It's like, then you're done. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. It will go nowhere. Like you have to either figure out like, oh, there's, a, there's an emerging group of people who are like kind of cool and I'm going to get in on that wave with them. Or I'm gonna, or I'm gonna do a new wave that's like one beyond. But you always have to take this gamble and then hope that it 
pays off, which is like the world went in your direction. And I, I don't want to say that I was strategic enough with Amatora to think that, but the thing that happened with the book and why it did well is because the number of people into menswear has massively increased. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you felt this with Blambo too yeah. in the last five years. Yeah. And the number of people who care about Japanese menswear has massively increased as part of that. And so, you know, when I wrote it in 2000. 13 or 14 or whatever, I probably just, um, out of complete delusion. You really wrote that that long ago? Yeah. Man. See, I still feel like that book came out four or five years ago. Maybe. Yeah. And it's, and it, it sounds like a book that came out last year instead of, you know, 10 years ago. But the crazy, the crazy thing is just when I wrote it, it was like, okay, uh, there's a couple dudes on Super Future. <laughs> Every so jeans, there's an audience for this. And I yeah. didn't realize it's like it's the same six people. It was a tiny, it was a tiny small audience. And as soon as the book came out, everyone's also like, I don't, I don't, I don't know who you are. I'm not reading that. So like it missed its initial push. But then every year, like 200, 500, 1,000, 2,000 new dudes got into menswear. Yeah. And they're like, I hear Beams is cool. And someone's like, oh, you like Beams? There's a book that actually explains where Beams comes from. It's like, oh, okay, I should read that. And so just like the, to extrapolate for a lesson for somebody is like do a thing in which you have faith that there's value there and that more people will discover that value and it'll increase over time. And you get if you get in early, then you can ride that wave rather than just trying to like, I don't know. I think, I think there's two, there's two things on, on the individual level. I want people to do this because it's like a more rewarding way to be creative, which is just like, don't like do things that you think will be popular rather than are popular. But then the, the ecosystem effect is really important too, because if you're just doing the thing that works, like, you know how people do the skits on Instagram? Like, <laughs> um, <laughs> like, uh, I'm half Jewish. Of course I eat half a bowl of matzo ball soup or whatever, you know, yeah, like yeah, that yeah. stupid meme <laughs> video, yeah, yeah, yeah. like that, if you see that and you're like, I'm in on that, like, then you're too late. Yeah. Like it, there's no, there's no interesting thing there. And so you've got the, the culture is not going to move forward if every single person on earth wakes up and they go, I got to make a video where it's like, I'm a B student. Of course I flunked geography or what, you know, whatever dumb demographic they're going to put themselves in and whatever stupid stereotypical jokes they're going to associate themselves with in that same meme format. Like if all culture is that video, they're like, culture is dead. So like, don't make that video Yeah, or anything we're associated with that video. The, the, but then the bigger question is, is, is that person going to be discovered, air quote, if they don't make that video first? Yeah. And so, so then the other, I mean, I would, this is another book I would love to do, which is something like <laughs> artistic strategies. Yeah. Cause there's like a, and this, the other thing is, so you and I, we, we were jamming before this. <laughs> this is true. Actually, that was a lot of fun. Yeah. yeah. We were jamming. But the point <laughs> is like, I'm not a professional musician, but you know, what's fun making music. Yes. And I make my own bread. And when I make my own bread, I eat it for breakfast. And I'm like, this is good, but I'm not like itching to sell that bread. <laughs> right. Yeah. And so I like making music, whether other people listen. It's nice when other people like it, but I got to make it. It's for me. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so the, the issue is, first of all, like, what is your goal? And I got to make Instagram videos. Yeah. I got to make some reels. Is it because you want? to make that your full-time job, you want to creatively express yourself or whatever it is. But in theory, there is a path that you're saying, which is that you could say, I'm going to make the video that's like, I'm a harpsichord. Of course, my keys are, my major <laughs> keys are black or whatever. You're going to do that video in order to get this whole podcast, just me doing increasingly pathetic versions of that meme. Um, but the, you're going to Make the dumb video in okay. theory okay. so that you can get to this this esteem and status to then make the thing you actually want to make. That happens. Yeah. But it's like, it's rare. Like people rarely do that. And I think there's only a handful of people, like the Beatles absolutely fit that pattern. But the re- the thing about the Beatles that's a secret is from the first I think Love Me Do is kind of an exception, but like every other thing they did, they always did one little musical twist in every song. Like, what if we did a sixth chord here or something? And every single time they were rewarded for it. So then they were like, well, now let's put a sitar in there. Like, great. And so they kept, they kept snowballing. Well, then like, oh, let's just have like a nine minute piece of uh, music concrete. That's just like someone saying number nine, you know, they could get there because they were never punished once for every small little risk they took, but they took risks from the very beginning. Whereas most people, they're like, I want to make 400 terrible, bland, mediocre videos. And the 401st one is going to be huge. Like you're just already in the groove of making non-interesting stuff. Like yeah. you've sold out before you even sell out. 
So the, I don't know. So there's people who do the weird stuff and they realize they have to play by the rules and then they play by the rules and they get bigger and then they never go back or sometimes they go back. I think a lot about Pharrell and the Neptunes. Like I think I think Neptune stuff was was generally innovative, but then they uh, they did 2002. They did Hot in Here. They did. Yeah, that's them. Oh my god, you're right. And that was a number one hit, right? And so then, Nelly, they, were, yeah, then they were like, well, what are we going to do? And so they did Clips, I guess, Grinding, and they did yep, um, yep. Drop It Like It's Hot. Yeah. And those songs are like the weirdest, most minimal beats, right? Like, especially Drop It Like It's Hot, it's just like tongue clicks and like, tss, like pink noise. <laughs> and that's the beat. And they said that this new dog is like, I don't know, man, but if you guys are into this, I'm into it. Right. Um, but that's, so that's the pattern. It's like, have your number one hit and then go weird and have another, another number one hit that's weird because you're the Neptunes. Yeah. But like, you got to, the game plan has to be at some point that you push things forward, that you're not just like. But all these things, the medium has to be your art. I, I guess I just want people to be artists and not. And I don't, I hate the the idea that the word creator is like, there's like a uh, a Venn diagram in which like <laughs> artists and creator never touch. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I think cre- artist is inside creator, but artist is someone who's ultimately their goal is to bring people somewhere that they've never been before. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, yeah, I mean, that's a bigger thing. It's like, what is the role of an artist? And and does an artist create for pleasure, you know, and is ever, and, or, you know, the bigger argument, who is it that said, like, is ever the question is, ever, was it Warhol? Like, is everything art or something? Well, um, there, so pop art did a thing where they're like, we're, because the abstract expressionists before us were so um, clergy-like and their yeah. weirdness, our whole thing to like out art them is to be super pop. Yeah. Right. Like we're going to be so weird against weird people that we're not weird. That, <laughs> like that's the idea. It's like double twisting back on itself. Yeah, yeah. And it kind of worked where it's like, whoa, that it is, that is the future of art. Cause it's not the thing before. Like it negates the thing before, which is the whole point. But then the problem is everyone's on Warhol. They're like, Oh cool. You can just do Marilyn Monroe. Yeah. Right. Great. Done. But they don't like, they don't get the context that that was a big deal. Like you weren't allowed to have iconography in your art. It had to be like this. Do you see the white paint? It drips, but there can't be like a figure in it. And then he's like, I got Marilyn Monroe here. Right. Yeah. So, uh, so that was Warhol. And then, um, I think it was Joseph Boy's, uh, I hope I'm saying his name right. Is he had a whole thing? It's like everyone is an artist, and it wasn't yeah. everybody can be an artist. It was like everyone is. Like right now, if you're breathing, you're making art. And like, oh god. And that's and again, <laughs> that's the kind of statement that someone's making just to be annoying. Like his statement is art, but like anyone who's like, yeah, I'm an artist. No, you're not an artist. <laughs> like you, you have to appreciate him as an artist. You by watching reels you're not being an artist right now right right, right. Like you have to actually do something um and so i i don't know i mean some of it's just i mean some of it's self- selfish which i want to be entertained by all of you i yeah. don't want to just watch those reels anymore <laughs> and i can't turn on tiktok because it's you know uh it's i guess but like the fact that instagram is not even just like i can't see i can barely see what you are doing like what is jeremy kirkland doing right now in the world that used to be the point of instagram yeah now it's like 10 percent is trying to figure out my friends in this this or thing it's of, like for me to make sure i can show you what i'm doing i need to make the meme of yeah of course i'm a podcaster <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's like of course i'm talking to a wall <laughs> um yeah or like uh recently pavement has had this b-side harness your hopes become the background for some meme i saw that yeah, where yeah, it's yeah, like yeah. people do this like twist in the air and then they follow i think that's like their clothes change or something mm-hmm. in the twist and you watch it and you're like it's interesting the pavement song is in this but it has nothing to do with pavement yeah it could be any song yeah it's like it's just funny that this band is being put into this new kind of gen z context but it's not like someone's listening to that being like i kind of get what the pavement guys were going for like the meme is no vehicle for pavements artistry well and that's the thing too where it's like because then you become right so in this case you have that feeling because you're an advocator of artists and you're a fan of pavement and you want people to understand pavement in the way, the way that, that pavement wants the way that understood. pavement wants to be understood yeah the way that Stephen Malkmus, you know, like how he was making that music to hear the full thing. And that's, you know, John Caramonica talks about this a lot too, where it's just like how people look at music now to where it, it it's just like, it, there's, there's not like a, 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 any sort of depth in some of the relationship because the, the acquisition and the means at which people are doing it. You know, the, the big thing would be, is there someone who said, Hey, I heard that song 
or that clip of that song and that reel. And I went and discovered Pavement. And now I'm in love with, you know, and now I'm into Steve Malkmus and the Jicks. Right. And now I'm in all these other things. Like, does that exist? And is that going to be, because I don't know if there's much of a case study that, that explains how these become entry points into this person and then it's selling records or it's putting, you know, them back on tour or something. You know? So look, I went to the Pavement tour, I think it was last year in Tokyo. They came to Tokyo. Oh, they did? That's awesome. So I was like, I gotta go. Because I'd never seen them live ever. So I gotta go. What'd you think? And they were so tight. They were like, they were probably yeah. the best they've ever sounded. Yeah, probably. And I was just so <laughs> underwhelmed. Like I love, I, I love Pavement and I loved Pavement as a kid, but I got really into them like later in life, like in my twenties, like I revisited all of it. And, and it's the kind of music that has enough depth that you can revisit it every five years and get something new. Yeah. But the whole time I'm just like, I'm just not feeling this because it's there. It's just a cash grab. You think like, it's the nicest cash grab, but they're like, Hey, look, Hey, it's cold sounds. Hey, you know, spin on a stranger. Hey, <laughs> now we're, now it's hey, do, 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 do. <laughs> like, it's just all, it just felt so there was no stakes. Okay. And, I, and I think this is the other problem with like, when you listen to music that's old or anything nostalgic, there's no stakes to it. Cause it's like, you know how it went and what's cool about anything contemporary and why people need to make contemporary stuff. And we can't just rely on nostalgia is because there has to be stakes. Like, and this was the worst outcome, but when Kurt Cobain killed himself, that was a big deal yeah. because the stakes were really high. Yeah. And like Nirvana was changing the way that aesthetics, like the aesthetics of that society at the time. Right. And then when he killed himself, I was like, oh, that's a really, that's a step I did not see coming. And that was kind of the end of that thing. Right. And, uh, and it was really sad and kids wouldn't, I don't even know if they would have this today, but I remember I was on spring break in 94. I was at my, my grandmother's house in Melbourne Beach, Florida with my friend Tim. And we had um, looked at, I was just watching local news and and it had like, it showed a picture of Kurt Cobain. And it was like, and I was like, oh, what did you do this time? Because like, I think a month before something, he had overdosed on pills. Yeah. And it, that was obviously a suicide attempt, but they played it off like, oh, he just accidentally had a couple of extra pills and some champagne in Italy. So I was like, what did you do this time? It's like, oh, Kurt Cobain was found dead. It was like, yeah. oh, holy shit. So I pulled Tim and he thought I was joking because I never said anything serious. And we went and we did like this vigil watching MTV because MTV went into full time 24 hour like Kurt Loader. Yeah. Being like, hey, everybody. Like, here's an update. Hey, uh, update. Here's what we're hearing. Here's Courtney Love reading the suicide note. And here's like a suicide prevention line. Like it was like 24 hour breaking news about Kurt Cobain's suicide. And then they played Unplugged like this vigil. Um and yeah, because that was, I think that was the biggest album at the time, even though they had done no, all these other studio out, they albums. they had not put out Unplugged as an album yet. Oh, they hadn't? No. Oh my and God. And so you just watch it. And then when he sings like, uh, where did you sleep last night? And you yeah. know, he's dead. Like he just died and he's singing this song and you're just like, oh, it, like it just doesn't get more emotional than that. Um, but you know, the stakes were high, but when you're watching Pavement on tour in 2024, it's like they could be doing this or whatever. They just like... Yay, I'm gonna go out to Portland and play some tennis or whatever Malcolm does. <laughs> and Malcolm is gonna make his music that it also like it's good, it's all right, it has no stakes. So I mean So you're not a fan of Stephen Malcolm's solo albums then? Like, but I'm not not a fan. Like, I don't have any problem with Stephen Malcolm. He needs to do his thing. I liked um Groove Denied, like the really weird rejected album that he did that was just all Do weird, you like it more because it was lead. weird? Yeah, because he was trying something that wasn't just like here's a bunch of songs. Yeah. Um and I guess in general, I don't like solo albums. Like we, when we were trying to figure out stuff to play, you're like, how about this Lennon song? It's like, I don't do post Beatles because <laughs> there's no stakes. Like who cares what Lennon was doing in the seventies? There were stakes. I don't think there were stakes. And Paul, I think Ram is the only, maybe that Ram is the Ram. worst and weirdest album so that good. Paul McCartney did. No, it's so good because of that. Cause like he was trying something different and it was a failure and he felt bad about it, but Listen to it now. It's well, it's a but, cool see, but yeah, but I think that's the point, right? Is is I mean, you're making the point in the sense that Ram is an album that people like because it was bad, and so it right, requires it's really good. Is it? <laughs> I, it? It requires work to understand. You can't just put it on. It's not like McCartney two. McCartney two is pretty weird. It may be. Is that the one with um or even, secretary or even McCartney one? Right? You know, um, McCartney one also does, like it's fine. It just doesn't have any stakes. He's like I don't know. I'll just make some four tracks on. But for him, right, McCartney won. He did by himself. Yeah. He more, they more or less did it in secret because the Beatles had somewhat broken up, but hadn't like 
officially broken up, you know, because Mac- um, McCartney one was supposed to come out and they said no and and pushed Let It Be because all of them were alive. I mean, it was an Apple Records release. And so um, they were like, no, 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 sorry, Let It Be needs to come out before McCartney won. But for him, he was like, this is this was how I want to prove myself and make an album that is a that is a full divorce musically from the Beatles, you know, right. and because this is the thing, like I like the solo albums in some cases, sometimes more than the original stuff, because you can hear the competition between both of them and what they were trying to You're do. You're leaving out George, but like the well, most. No, I'm not because then George comes in and dunks on <laughs> yeah, all of them. Right. And then that's, but you feel the stakes. Leaving out Ringo. <laughs> You feel the stakes with All Things Must Pass because he's like, oh, you have ignored me yeah, for like ever and I'm going to come up with this triple album that's going to blow you all away and it does. But it's like he had that kind of, I got something to prove. I guess it's like having something to prove is really important and Pavement on tour in 2024, <laughs> tight band, great songs, whatever, nothing to prove to anybody. Like they just. And, you know, Malcolm seems to be, I don't want to speak for him. He seems bored. It's just like, yay. Like, does he ever need to play cut, cut your hair again? Yeah. I don't know. The question is like, what is the life that Malcolm is trying to live right now? That's requiring him to go out and do the tour. It's just, he, I mean, couldn't he start a tequila brand or something? You know, Mal, like a, he could do a craft gen. Definitely. Yeah. Like a Malcolm craft gen. That's all references to Jig songs. Would you, would you buy it? No. <laughs> Really? Craft, craft Gen all the way. This is now just going to a rant about Craft Gen. Like my <laughs> understanding, and if you make Craft Gen and you want to tell me why I'm wrong about this, but like whiskey, the thing about whiskey is you make it and you put it in barrels and yeah. it has to like sit there for years. Yeah. yeah. So like when you drink Yamas like a 12 year in 2024, it's like somebody had the foresight <laughs> in 2012 to like bury that underground or put it in a warehouse or whatever, right? Yeah. Gin and literally my understanding is like you take grain alcohol and you put some herbs in it. And last time I checked, juniper berries were not that expensive. <laughs> and you put them in a bottle for a week. And then you're like, ta-da, I got craft gin and it's $70 a bottle or whatever. Like, wh- what What? am I paying for? Dave Marks is not a gin drinker. I love no, I love it. That's the thing. It's like, <laughs> but like beef eater is $9. Is in it really? Japan. In Japan, it's super cheap. It's like 990 yen or something, right? Yeah. So if I can get beef eater for that, and beef eater is great. It's fine. I, f- I would have pegged you as a Hendrix guy. Uh, it's fine. They're all fine. Like, I don't, I'm not a snob about them. Like tinker eight, whatever. But the point is, I don't know why I'm paying extra. Now I like it. I like these craft gins. They taste good. Mm-hmm. But like, are, what additional thing are you doing to create a $60 differential? Well, I mean, now you're just getting into alcohol and brand marketing. You're buying, you're buying it because it says something about you. Sure. Or it's like somebody who makes it is like, I want to make a middle class living off this. And so I'm going to charge you the extra. Yeah. Or they have to pay for advertisements and do that where you just build, you build your rights, you know, but sure. Yeah. I, I hear you. I mean, alco- just selling alcohol in general is a... <laughs> This is a losing stakes game. And then you make a hundred X of whatever you, you did, you know, ages later. Um, that was what's called a rant. Yeah. No, that, I, I don't that's think there's any intelligence to it, but uh, it was just pavement was just to wind things back. Um, just because I feel like not everybody is interested in my take on 90s alternative rock. You're in Japan. Yeah. And when's the last time you were here? Never. I just came through once. This is the first time I'm in like proper, really? proper Oh, God. Tokyo. Gotta, you can't spin it in my basement all day. So... <laughs> Uh, well, I'm here. I've been, you know, I've been here, what, four days. But what's your, impre- like, what's your impression compared to what you thought? I think Tokyo is, like, in many ways, heaven to me. But the thing that I'm the, the most, like, that's actual, like, a, a tangible sort of impression that I think is easy to explain is there is a level of respect in everyone's career yep. and, and service. And I think that's something that I was, like, as I thought about it more, I, I like, got emotional in the sense that whatever it is that that person's doing, whether it's, like, a prime example is we were walking down the street and there was, a, like, a, a security guard or something. He was just outside. It wasn't a famous building. It wasn't, it was just, you know, perfect posture, you know, doing it, doing it well. And I was like, I really respect that. And where people were treating that person also with some level of respect. Yes. He wasn't Paul Blart mall cop. Yes. And I think that was the thing. Even though those jobs are identical. Yeah. And I think that was the thing that I saw and I was like, oh, wow. Like there's a respect for anyone's career, job, craft. And that is just a place that I, it's a, it's a society that I want and long for. And in a sense that, you know, why do we look 
down and this like you could this is true when people are going to look down on a service job Mm -hmm. or and they're all service jobs yeah and it's like why would you know yeah you work at when okay you remember like for a long time like back in the day people would say if you don't do this you're going to be flipping burgers yeah a mick job Yeah. yeah and you have tons of people who have those levels of jobs and as far as i'm concerned it doesn't they don't appear to be mocked for their choice or career and that like that's probably the biggest thing that I saw because yes the retail's good yes the clothes are good but you can also find good retail in other places it's even though better. I think this is the best here yeah I mean <laughs> you it, know I, like the world is caught up to Japan a little bit yeah but this, I think the scope like the the number of stores in Tokyo is still like exponential compared yeah. to other places but if you want to buy a certain brand like I was in Paris and London last year and like I couldn't think of that many places I could go to to buy something unique that wasn't already available in Japan. But now it's becoming the opposite too. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with that. But I think like that was the thing that I saw that I was just like, man, that's so, I mean, it's so beautiful. And I was talking to uh, Sedgwick McCarthy, who was talking about how, you know, this is a, this is a society where it's difficult to fall down hard. Um, And when I mean fall down, I mean like, like professionally, personally, you know, there, there is a, there is a way out of whatever sort of situation you might be in. And at least in America, it's, you can fall down pretty hard Mm -hmm. and it it might take a long time to get back to where you want to be in your head. And I think, you know, a lot of this, I, I imagine is rooted in just the, the, what, what, not Confucianism, but like Shinto and things like that. And the concept of, uh, you know, single mind and, and, and honor and stuff. But like, I don't know. I think like just seeing that, I was like, damn, I was like this part of Tokyo and this part of Japan in general, I'm just like move. Like it's, you know, I'm like, why don't we fucking bow in the States? I'm like, I'm really, <laughs> you know, and I'm not trying to sound like yeah. this isn't a bit, but I'm like, no. I'm really into this. Like, I want to show you respect. You want to show me respect. And people, you know, treating themselves with respect and then uh, that creating this kind of wave where everybody is being polite. I mean, that's the way that society is supposed to work. That's the way that liberal society is supposed to work is like we respect each other and we give each other a normal status. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it doesn't matter what your job is and what your background is and we're going to do that. Um, and one of the problems is that if you show up to your job and you're like, I'm so above this and you treat it like you're above it, then obviously like you're not treating it with respect and people aren't going to treat you with respect. Um, I don't look, I don't want it, to, it's my friend, uh, the blogger Noah Smith and I talk about the idea of the redistribution of respect mm-hmm. and that like, that's what's happening in Japan. It's like, there isn't this premium on the only people who are respected are incredibly famous, rich people like yeah. everybody gets some level of respect yeah and it really does make society work better my i guess my the thing i think about and why i'm not quick to jump on like well everybody should, everywhere should be like japan is because i don't know how to bring that to the united states like you can't I don't i mean it, maybe it's too late i think there was some point where there was a little more of it and and you can blame lots of certain things like institutional racism or like class income inequality or all sorts of problems that uh, the plague the United States, but um, it's really hard to bring that. But like, I think in some ways, if you, and you know, in, in status and culture, I try not to be prescriptive. Like there's not a part where it's like, here's what you should do. Yeah. But like in a small way, if you can give the people around you respect for the work that they do, I think it it could make the world a nicer place. But like, if you just if you're creating that positivity around you, it does kind of spread. And you know, just talking about these security guards, like they have kind of bullshit jobs. Like, it's not what are they protecting things from? Like, are we really concerned that if a a thief with a knife comes in, that this guy is going to stop them? But in the United States, they're like, you know, those security guards at the mall. We should make an entire film that makes fun of them. And yeah. then forever, every single one of them will be called Paul Blart. Yeah. And we will just disgrace this entire profession instead of like, this is a service job that somebody's going every day to do. And it, like, there's but that a, movie was made because that, uh, that assumption existed. Yeah. So I'm not, we're not going to blame the creators of that film for yeah. they, like, everyone's like, I love, do you love security guards? I love mall cops. Like, <laughs> And they're like, no, we're going to take them down a notch. Yeah, I mean, because mall rats truth. was before mall cop. You're going to see you know. the truth about mall cops now. Yeah. So obviously mall cop is like, has been a, as a, <laughs> a pejorative term for a long time. But in general, there is a sense that like, there are these people doing useless jobs and they're useless and we need to make them feel useless. And it's like, it's just negative. And you realize why society uh, is always like on a, when people feel disrespected, it's like obviously leads to depression and a lot of anger. And if you look at the United States right now, there's a lot of anger. And I think a lot of that comes out of every single person feeling disrespected for some reason. Yeah. And, you know, again, I can't describe it as 
prescriptive thing that, hey, Americans, like borrow this thing from Japan because it's not that easy or simple. But when you come to Japan, you will feel a society that is not at each other's throats at all time and angry all the time. It, yeah. like, it generally works and people treat each other with respect. One additional point on this, which is interesting, is the biggest change in Japan in the last five years, but it, like, it's escalated up in the last two, uh, post-COVID, is the number of foreign workers. So it used to be like most everyone was Japanese and there was a small group of, let's say, uh, Chinese and Korean immigrants or students who were often uh, dressed so much like people from Japan. Like if you walked down the street, you couldn't tell. Mm -hmm. And now you go to a convenience store. I think the people who work at the convenience store down the street for me are from Uzbekistan is my guess. Like they're central Asian of some kind. Um, and there's been this whole thing of like, number one, Japan can never be multi-ethnic. It will always be this like single ethnicity state and it has to be that way and everything will fall apart. But it really has become diversified and it's kind of going okay. And like the standards of service are... Uh, obviously for people who have not been steeped in Japanese culture, like they just can't get up to the level. And yet like it still works because everyone's trying and everyone's being nice. Right. And like there's, there's, there was uh, something on X, formerly Twitter yesterday that I saw that was going viral. And Komune Kohi, which is like a coffee chain, had this sign in, in the window that said, hey, a lot of our staff are foreign. They just came to this country. And can you imagine being new to a place where you don't really even speak the language and like you don't know how to do the job and suddenly you're like waiting on a bunch of people. So please like show them respect and they're doing their best. Like mm. some of them can't even speak Japanese that well. So be nice to them. And like that was written in Japanese on the door. And it was like, how, like what are these worries? I mean, I don't want to take one data point and be like, well, Hey, Japan solved its uh, <laughs> xenophobia problem. But, but at the same time, there is a sense that like the level, the standard of service may be going down a little bit because there's a labor shortage. I mean, the, the other thing is like, there's a labor shortage. So you can't even get the Japanese staff who've had a lot of experience doing things. But the thing that you described, which is just a general expectation of giving respect to people and getting respect back, like it papers over the like the service level. Right. So people say it's the service, but it's not the service. It's like the general, like, hey, everyone, let's have a society in which we respect each other. Yeah. I mean, I because I think like that's the thing that like has hit me the most because yes, I think the food's very good, but all of these things, the food is good. The clothes are good, et cetera. You, if you boil that down and that further and further, you're like, oh, it's because there's respect for the workers. There's respect for the supply chain. There's respect for the ingredients. There's respect, for, you know, and that's just like probably been the most head spinning thing, you know, um, especially when my understanding, you know, I, I think a good example is right. Okay. So I had Karin Osan on yep. and we were from doing United a podcast, Yeah. From United Arrows. And he was talking about getting dressed and he was, and he was, you know, I asked him, I said, you know, how long does it take you to get dressed? And he's like, oh, five minutes. And I was like, oh, really? I was like, what goes through your mind? And he's like, well, I knew I was going to see you today and you're American. And I wanted to make sure I was, you know, showing you that I also like American style. And so, you know, now this conversation took a lot longer because of, you know, the language barrier. But he was like, yeah, it, you know, I wanted to show you that I like American style. I wanted to wear seersucker. I care about this. And I wanted to, you know, be respectful to you. And, da, da, da. and I was like, and my head just kind of exploded because I realized that I get dressed not always to like, Yes, I want to be respectful of where I am, but it is more of a way to protect myself. And that, I mean, look, this is from my you know own point of view, but it was like, no, 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 I'm going to wear this because I want people to believe A, B, and C about me mm -hmm. in a way that I'm trying to protect myself, that like I belong to a level of society or come from a certain thing, or I have the knowledge of this, this, and this. His he was so confident in who he is and didn't have the fear, at least at the time, or that he's communicating to me, of how he could be misinterpreted. He was just like, I'm wearing this because Jeremy's here and I want him to feel good. And I was like, that in a nutshell is like the core of that discussion, which I was, you know, still, I'm still processing post it. Um, and I think that's, that's a thing that I was like, God, I was like, how much, you know, confidence do you need to have to be able to think like that? You know, did you, and to right. just be so warm. Well, he has been shot by the sartorialist. <laughs> so he's like, as you know, I'm a global style icon. What yeah. color seersucker was he wearing? Uh, like blue and white? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm sure he has like pink and white. I'm sure he's got a whole closet. Yeah, he had like, he's, yeah and his shirts and everything was kind of perfect. And, you know. But here, so here's the thing about fashion in general, which is when you're doing your fit check for <laughs> Instagram or whatever, and you're yeah. like, look at me. 
It's very much like you're, it's about you. Yes. And the reason like we watch Mad Men and we're like, wow, everyone dressed so well. Because it wasn't for them. It was for everyone else. Yeah. yeah. Right? And so this is like this point that Georg Zimmel, the sociologist, he has this essay about adornment that I read a long time ago. And it kind of, it was just like the simple thing that blew my mind, which is like, if everyone has to dress up, you're creating this like world in which everyone's dressed up. Yeah. And so everyone else gets to enjoy everyone else dressing up. Yeah. And, but then when you're in the mindset of like, what am I going to wear to like look good for me? Like you're about like, I'm beaming out all this information because I want other people to think like, you know, as you said, like, what are they going to think of me? But also like, are they going to like how I'm dressed? Are they going to think I'm yeah. cool or whatever? But then it's never like, I'm going to get dressed up so that everyone around me is like, I had a better day because that person was dressed up. Yeah. And that's his mentality. Yeah. It, I, it just was so moving. And it also made me, you know, I mean, obviously I've been transparent in the past about like, you know, wrestling with any sort of mental health or figuring out who I am or, or, or trying to, you know, like it, for me, the, the reason why I love clothes the most is it's helped me learn how to be more okay with who I am and mm-hmm. what I'm good and not good at, you know, and clothes have been the medium and, and the, the, the way for me to fail in a way that felt safe. Like, Oh, I tried that. It didn't work. You're but saying I, you break some fits. Yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm yeah. I break fits all the time. I break to fit once. Yeah. <laughs> but I think like, I was just so moved by that to where, you know, and also, you know, in the, in, Because as I talked to him more, I was like, the point of the conversation was, because I think he was maybe even, you know, a little bit caught off guard by like, I had no questions or desire to discuss what his outlook should be on trends. Because Mm -hmm. I don't think that... I don't think he has an outlook on that. He has an outlook on what's good. Yeah. But, and and also I'm just like, that, that also seems relative. That's like an empty calorie thing. Yeah. You know, like I, to know more about him, because I also was trying to be like, okay, I've, I care more about you than what you've accomplished. So like, you know, and I think that in a good way, I think he was somewhat, um, and maybe I'm misinterpreting, but it seemed he was warm and receptive to that, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, especially trying to figure out. Because, you know, I was like, oh, I was like, so you, were you born in Japan? He's like, oh, no, I was born in New York. <laughs> I was like, oh, OK. But uh, yeah, I, so it was just very interesting to me. And I think like that is something that I want to try to find a way to impress upon myself more. Um, and it's not a confidence thing, but to just this level of sort of respect to individuals. And Japan's done that a lot. Yeah, I mean, I think certainly if you get to his level of career success and influence and age yeah you you can you mellow out a bit yeah but like I, I mean the thing the thing i feel of two minds of as you were talking i was thinking about of course as you talked i was thinking about what i was going to say next because that's what's <laughs> that's what's important um <laughs> but what I, what I thought about is like you know advice to kids getting dressed up is some of it's like if you just get dressed up you make the world a better place but the thing is, in the United States, like often you get dressed up. It's like, oh, look who's dressed up today! Yeah, and, like you who's attract got a job all interview. this who's got, yeah, yeah. attention that you're like, just enjoy it. Like, don't give me a hard time about it. But there, I think that the issue is because everyone's so casual. If you're like the one guy who gets dressed up, mm-hmm. then you're gonna get shit for it. Yeah, because it's like, oh, look who it is again wearing Mr. Fashion. It's like this, guys. This is just a Ralph Lauren <laughs> shirt. Like, it's not a big deal <laughs> or whatever. But um, I don't think I. I I forget if I told you this last time, but when I was in San Francisco, like people from a car, a moving car, rolled down the windows to yell at me, nice necktie. Really? Because I was wearing a necktie. and I In was, a uh, mock, mock, mocking style? Yeah. Like, oh. not like, hey, 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 nice necktie. Like, very much like, hey, nice necktie, asshole. Like, and it was, it was just like a normal necktie that I was wearing for fashion reasons. Or the number of, I work, when I worked at Google, the number of meetings that would stop, literally stop. They'd be like, okay, so in the algorithm, they're going to, uh, sorry, hold on. Um, who's in the background wearing the suit? Really? It's <laughs> like minute 18 of a like serious meeting. And it's like, uh, sorry. And then everyone turns to me and I'm like, this isn't a suit. This is, um, this is just a tweed blazer. <laughs> and everyone's like, oh, and they're like, okay. And then. So the meeting guys, ends. this isn't a suit. But my, the, it's not a suit because the pants aren't aren't the same yeah. fabric. It's like, do you the... guys not read Die Workwear? Yeah. So, uh, so the meeting ends, and the VP of search comes over, and he's like, "Hey, what department are you in?" Huh. And I was like, "Oh, um, communications." And then he turns to his the guy's like, "I told you so." Really? <laughs> like they were doing side bets because like no one had ever worn a necktie before and it was so disruptive that like they literally had to stop the meeting and this would happen multiple times um 
And my nickname in the office was like English gentleman. <laughs> because like there was like, why do you wear suits? I was like, they're not suits, they're just jackets, like yeah. or whatever. But so I I think that is the tension, which is there is now this like barrier that there shouldn't be, which is like getting dressed up. It's good for you, as you said. Like it helps you think through things. It's good for the world for people to be more dressed up. And yet there's like this wall of tension where it's like, oh, people are too dressed up. And the one thing in Tokyo that is nice is you can get dressed up and people won't give you shit for it. Yeah, I mean, so I wore uh, <laughs> I wore these Madras, they're vintage Ralph Lauren like Madras pants. Mm-hmm. They are loud That's fucking loud, pants. Yeah. It's loud. And I wore it and, you know, I mean, I feel like you can do this a little bit in New York. No one really cared. And it was great. And a few people, because I, you know, I, I'd gone into Beams and they were like, very nice. Right. Very, very nice. And yeah. then people were like, oh, Ralph Lauren, you know. Like, is this Ralph Lauren? I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're like, very good. Yep. Classic style. Excellent. You know, and I, I like, to me, I think that's so, it was great. It was just, you know, and, and like, I, it's funny because I purposely brought those pants because I knew I could wear them here. You could pull them off here. And if I wore them in St. Louis, Missouri. Sure. Which is not a, to make fun of anyone in St. Louis for right. whatever listener might say that I'm going to hate on the city. I don't. I love St. Louis. But I know that if I wear those pants. You're going to get people are gonna all day. Yeah. People are going to be like, what? What what's the point of that? Or what are you what are you trying to do? Or are you going somewhere? Like, well, the you, irony you know, like is that forty years ago, like at a weekend barbecue, people were wearing those pants in Missouri. Yeah, and like the, so much of what I wear still, it's like when I grew up in Mississippi, like, yeah. we just wore that stuff, right? And uh, there's a photo I did this thing for Men's Club recently uh, with Sebago, the shoe brand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I found some old photos of me wearing Sebago, like at you know age nine. Oh, sick. and I was just like, so I sent it to them, and they were just literally like me hanging out, and it was like I was wearing. Like a bright yellow polo shirt over cool. Madras shorts. Nice. And no, at no point would I've been like, yeah, like like doing a fit check or you know thinking that I, this was fashion at all. It's just like yeah. how people dressed. And so I think what's also sad is that something like mattress pants, like these go to hell pants, yeah, yeah used yeah. to just be a part of American society. Yeah, like like people who are not into fashion. Like I think about my dad a lot. Like my dad wears and especially wore in the past, like rep ties and tweed and button down shirts and charcoal flannel pants or whatever. He like all these things he would never consider himself he's a fashion person. Yeah. It's like society just dressed up. Yeah. And there's like this famous uh David Sedaris line that like Americans in Paris showed up like they're gonna mow France's lawn or something. <laughs> and there is like something about how dressed down America is that it's gone to a level where it's not just like, oh, it's nice that you dressed up. It's like you're stressing us all out yeah. by wearing something that isn't like no effort at all. Yeah. Well, good thing you don't have to deal with Google stuff anymore. That's I'm going to say like just in general, like I, I will make this observation. That's really shitty that you had that experience. In I mean, a professional it, I think environment. in the kind of microaggression spectrum of yeah. being told that you dress too well, it's very low. Like, I've never considered this to be, like, I was ever hurt by it. No. But the, the, the annoying, it was just annoying because you would be in a meeting trying to, like, do professional things. Yeah. And you would have all these VPs be like, get this, David's wearing a tie. Like, you know, you're like, okay, great. <laughs> Can we talk about the crisis that we're dealing with at the moment? Because the government of India is really mad at us. Can we not talk about my necktie or whatever it is? <laughs> and and so that was the annoying part. But it, me, I wasn't walking out of that meeting being like, I got to talk to HR about no, this. No, like, no, no. And I'm you not, know. I'm not even suggesting like that was a thing. I just think it's just like, it's, that's how casual so many people have gotten. Oh yeah. Or the fact that like this, you know, for many ways to, to zoom back out to, the, the earliest conversation we were having when we started recording, this podcast kind of was able to grow and flourish because it was a podcast and people could listen to it and like could co- almost be secretive about it. But it's mm-hmm. like when people be like, yeah, I also, um, I listen to a men's fashion podcast because I like clothes, you know? And yeah. it was like, like that was the, that was ma- what made it niche and, and like exciting for people. And for me, even then, like, even now I'm like, dude, clothes are, clothes are not the point, you know? Like it's, it, it's, it's expressing yourself. It's, you know, it's learning who you are from it. And it's also like, can we just create a safe environment so you could wear whatever you want? You know, yep. as, as long as you weren't wearing a shirt that was like, fuck you, you know, I don't <laughs> like know. Like a big was, Confederate flag that says, yeah, if at first you don't secede, try, try again, <laughs> <laughs> which is a t-shirt I've seen in Japan. Um, oh my God. But uh, no, like the problem with this no dress code thing is like, don't dress up. It actually means don't dress up. Because if you show up to an event that's no dress code, 
and you're, or you're just, a company and yeah. you have a necktie again people will be like what is happening here and i think some of it i i'm slightly sympathetic to which it's it's that people are stressed out like oh should i have also worn a necktie yeah like, i get really stressed out of any dress code thing when i show up i'm like is, is this cotton suit is it all gonna be wool like and then i get there like everyone doesn't even know what a suit is because like, the standards so low now that like nobody you can all, you're always gonna be overdressed if you're even thinking those questions but uh I don't know. But again, like the thing that is nice about Japan, and I would say probably this carries across a lot of Asia, is you can get dressed up. Yeah. It's a society in which they still let you get dressed up. And yeah. when I was in Milan, I would also say people dressed really well. They weren't dressing menswear y. Like people were in suits. Like, mm-hmm. but it was nice to also be in Milan because the average person, like in the main section of Milan, was dressed up really well. Yeah, yeah. but if you cruise around outside of Milan, outside of other cities that maybe are somewhat less metropolitan, you're not seeing that. No, it was the same in same in the United States with New York, and that obviously like people dress well better in New York than anywhere else. But even in New York, or I, I did like that about New York, is you could kind of dress however you want. But yeah. Um, that's what a cosmopolitan city is. But the the provincial, just the fact that like dressing in ways that provincial people did 40 years ago is now not provincial is frustrating in that if I want to dress, if you go to Mississippi now, I don't think there's as many people. And, it's a lot of on running. Yeah. Navy, Navy blazers and blue and red reptiles and, and khakis. Um, although in, and I was asking someone about the Mississippi University of Mississippi tailgate situation. Cause I think what tailgate was like before the football game, everyone would bring their like trailer to the Grove mm-hmm. and they would have these like barbecues before the game. And it was like this really cool culture where people were showing up dressed really well. Mm. And this was like the eighties, I guess. And so I asked someone, do they still do that? And it's like, Oh, they've actually tried to tone down the dressing up, like to be more inclusive or something. And, and I don't know the politics of it, so I don't want to comment too much on it, but like, I don't know. It's just, it's not, it's nice to create situations where people have to dress up. Yeah. And I really think this is, uh, and I talked to Mark Cho uh, from the armory quite a bit about this, but I'm like, you need to make more events where people have more opportunities to wear the clothes they do. And if you go to a party, the armory, it's like a bunch of kids in their Sunday finest showing yeah. up because it's like, where else can they go do that? And that's great. But there also needs to be more casual versions of this that the theme of the party is not menswear. Do you see the difference? Yes. It's like the theme of the party is Manhattans. Or it's like it's yeah. the drink or it's like yeah. the music or something. And then you happen to have to get dressed up. Yeah. Versus Whereas, like we're in the Thai club. Yeah. <laughs> versus like it's a Halloween party except for the theme is menswear. Because yeah. then it's like, hey, nice, uh, nice thing there. You know, so I think co- the clothing is coolest when it's casual, but we've got to create more situations where you can dress up in a casual way. And by the way, totally ridiculous, which is that we both showed up uncoordinated wearing the exact same outfit. Yeah. And I'm going to change before we go out. Because you don't want us to look the because same. Because like, even your jacket, we have different jackets, but they're both kind of similar, like blue rain jackets, navy blue rain jackets. Yeah. Um, but we're wearing open, kind of open collar, semi-open collar. Yep. Yep. Uh, Ox- Saks blue button down mm-hmm. shirt over like a white t shirt that's meant to be shown a little bit. Yep. This is true. And khakis, except for yours, are like a stone color. You, and here's the crazy thing dead serious. As I was getting dressed this morning, you almost went for the British khaki? I did. Yeah. 100%. And it's funny because so Jeff Hilliard and I are sharing a room and, uh, um, Jeff, I was like, yo, I was like, which one, you know, I mean, dude's like my brother. And I was like, yo, I was like, which, which ones would you wear? And he was like, they both are fine. And I was just like, well, which one would you wear? He's like stone. I was like, hell yeah. And I put it on, but it's like, it, I was about to wear the khaki one. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. We would have been super twinsies. I like to call that color stone gossard. <laughs> well, but okay. Here's a, qu- a question because I feel like. It's a deep cut people. <laughs> the, the, uh, um, in terms of like what I'm wearing now. And I was telling you this, like, I feel like, you know, because someone asked me a question where it was like, hey, has your style changed since you've left New York? And I was like, no. And then I was like, actually, it has. But it's also, you know, because I, I don't really have, you know, I said this, like, I don't really have like a runway anymore. But I also am not trying to do that. And I realize what I gravitate to the most is like the most basic, classic mm-hmm. sort of stuff now. You know, I mean, this is, the, obviously I picked this out to wear, but it's also like, it's just what I would. But you could wear that grab. in St. Louis and no one would give you shit for it. Exactly. Yeah. And that's the thing too. But also it? like, it, it's on trend. Yeah. I, like, I think I, that's, that's another thing that's true. I do yeah. think, um, yeah, I, I dress 
way more down than I used to. Yeah. Like there's I, like I like neckties in theory. I just find it harder to wear neckties and <clears throat> there's fewer opportunities to and then when I do it feels it just feels uptight. Yeah. No, I get it. And it's interesting that, yeah, especially because society, you know, the pendulum swung so far the other way where it's like now if you're wearing that, you're making the other person uncomfortable versus yeah. versus like, no, like is this guy's a, yeah. Yeah, if someone shows up next time, it's like, is there a thing? Yeah. Oh my god. You know, yeah. like you were saying you check dress codes because you didn't want to But even like, you know, Yamamoto san from Cade, like he doesn't wear a necktie all the time. No. And no, he, he doesn't want I was with him. He didn't, he didn't I went in there to... to get a suit, um a, a cotton suit, and of course he was like, Yeah, I got this military twill. It's either in uh khaki or olive. Pick one. It's like, isn't this a bespoke tailor? <laughs> yeah. Like, don't I have the power? But um <laughs> there, he's like a brand. Like there's a Cade, he's got yeah. his line of stuff. He's got all. his aesthetic. But he but he has such good taste. Like, don't don't like the thing about going to a tailor or an architect, like you pick them and then you let them do their thing. Yeah. Like don't, don't get in the way. But anyway, uh, he, he designed that suit to be, to look great without a tie. Right. To wear open collar or, or, and wear with New Balance. And he was like, oh, you should wear these with New Balance. Now to tie all this together, I think the idea of wearing suits with New Balance comes from Karino san United Arrows. Like, yeah. I think he invented that. If someone can prove me wrong, that there's someone who did that before Karino san. Yeah. I mean, cause that's the thing is like, even like when we were recording, I was like, man, I really want to be conscious. But, you know, and not just turn this into like dissect your style, dissect your style, you know, and and try to make this. But like a part of me was like, he's made, he's pulled off so many wild, crazy fits over the years. Is it a Ralph? trickled down. Yeah. Like if you saw a suit with New Balance today, you'd be like, well, yeah, of course. Yeah. But it all comes from him. Like he at some point had to be like, I'm going to do this thing that's radical. Same with, I think, like uh, Ralph Lauren and Solomon shoes with tailored clothing. You know, a lot of people where it's like when when someone asked him about it and it was like, yeah, he had injured his foot like skiing. Mm. And so that was just the shoe he was wearing. Right. It, I'm like, you know, at least that's what he said. Maybe it was that he wanted to just do something super crazy outlandish. But the point is he was wearing, you know. A, a jacket, tie, jeans, and Solomon XTs. You know, I mean, I I dress pretty basic, and then I wear mischief boots, like those red boots, just because <laughs> like my foot hurts. The a Astro lot. Boy, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, just they're really comfortable. I don't even I don't even think about what footwear I have. I just put on whatever, and it's always the mischief boots, just because <laughs> you know. <laughs> It's cool doing this on site. Yes. Thank you for having me uh, in your home. This is the first podcast I've recorded with a person in the home. I know you because you've done your fair share of, of interviews out of this house, just maybe not with someone else also in it. I do. Um, but it's great. It's great having you over. Thanks for coming. Yeah. Thank you, man. Thank you for the vegan donuts. Yeah. Good chat. All right. I'll see you. You've been listening to Blamo. Our show is produced by Blamo Media. We're edited by Amar Lull and our theme music, as always, by the mysterious Breakmaster Cylinder. If you like what you heard, you know the drill. Share the pod with a friend. Leave a review on Apple Podcasts. Give us five stars or thumbs up on whatever other thing you're listening to us on, whether it's Dingledorp or Bing Bong, whatever it's called. But you can also follow us on Instagram for all the hot content. If you want to talk to us and give us your hot take, we'd love to hear from you. You can send us an email at info at blamopod.com. Last but not least, super ultra important. If I had an air horn, I would press it right now. You got to come and join us over on Patreon because the fun never stops over there. Look, the the, the live show, the, the, the free show, whatever you want to call this, we take breaks here and there. But Patreon, it never stops. And we also got exclusive shows like... Die Workwear, hosted by Derek Guy and Peter Zatolo, and the Triple J Show, hosted by yours truly with uh, John Moy and Gene Deleon. There's there's just a ton of stuff over there. So check it out at patreon.com forward slash blamo. If not, no worries. We got hundreds and hundreds of free episodes in the feed and uh, more to come. So we will see you all soon. 